I told the guys six and six might be what we are. Six and six might be what we are. We're bowl eligible and we're six and six. And uh, obviously we could have won some and we could have lost some we won. So maybe we just say this is where we are and go try to win us a bowl game. Simple as that. Welcome into our final edition of Gamecock Chalk Talk. Corey Miller here with you. Of course, the Gamecocks in the Palmetto Bowl. Uh, kind of okay name for that rivalry game. But the Gamecocks take it on the road up to Clemson, South Carolina. High noon, trying to make it six in a row. But the Tigers had the clock going, and they were definitely ready for this ball game. And they defeated the Gamecocks 35-17, to in which the uh, defense well, went back to the old defense. And the <laughs> offense <laughs> did not show up. Alongside Mike Hole and Mike, of course, uh, it is our last Gamecock chalk talk. Hopefully, we, 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 were, we were hoping, I should say, that we'll be sitting here uh, feeling good about the game. Talking about a win. And the Gamecock victory, but not to be uh, the Gamecocks. To me, Mike, I didn't even watch it from uh, Alabama. I didn't feel like the emotion, I didn't feel like the excitement was there with this ball game. Exactly. Yeah. I didn't feel it at all that first series, Corey. I thought, uh, or when we scored, I thought, ah, we got a chance. But then after that, it was just flat. And, you know, give Clemson credit. They were a better football team this year, mm -hmm. maybe. I mean, definitely Saturday, right. but probably this year. Well, I mean, Wayne Gallman rushed for 191 yards. And the freshman, Deshaun Watson, now that we found out he played with a torn ACL this ball game. Because we'll talk about that later Man, on as well. And he, 269 yards. Although the 269 yards really is deceiving when you talk about Ortavia Scott. And those basically as a run play, if you ask me. But unfortunately, it goes as a pass. As a quarterback, I'll take the uh, pass. Of course you would. Just that here, let me just pitch it to you <laughs> and you go run the football. We'll start the game right here. Of course, uh, Clemson backed up. The Gamecocks had a chance to, to really pin them down. You know, they, the punter did a great job of pinning them down. But they had... Uh, uh, some good offensive plays here. We see one of the few reverses, jet sweeps, whatever you want to call it. We did not, Mike, defend that all day long. No, we didn't. And that was just a sign of things to come right there, Cor. And Dylan Thompson, you know, I talked about the tight ends being a factor in this ball game. And in that first quarter, I thought that was going to be something we saw that the guys were getting open down the building. Of course, Pharaoh Cooper, the guy who uh, had the bruised ribs, came into the ball game. The Wildcat formation scores a touchdown. Uh, the Gamecocks take a 7 nothing lead. Right there, Cooper, 63 total yards in that one touchdown. And you can see here, Clemson basically down the seam on the skinny post right there. Uh, you know, my, the defense, I don't know, I did not seem motivated. I mean, well, I, I didn't see the motivation. And they made great strides towards the end of the season, Corey, but this game was a step back. Uh, yes. Bad tackling, bad angles, uh, couldn't get pressure to the quarterback. Nothing went on for the defense. Yeah, and the offense was not crisp either. Uh, of course, you see a little dump pass here to Mike Davis. Thought he could be a big factor in the ball game. But the offense really, at the end of the day, was not really good. And of course, again, Gallman, uh, those guys ran the ball. They threw the ball. They just did what they wanted to do. We talked about Clemson's defense, though. We knew it would be a challenge uh, for the offense of South Carolina. As you can see, their great penetration. They sacked Dylan Thompson, I believe, four times in the ball game. So the offensive line wore down. And then right here, here's a guy with a bad knee, a torn ACL, a run the quarterback sneak uh, to, for a touchdown there. Just, I was really shocked and surprised, uh, Mike, Lorenzo Ward, when you playing with a quarterback. The rule of thumb is anytime you know you had a, have a hurt player, like, like Deshaun Watson, when that offense is really predicated on him running the football, why don't you bring pressure? You got a front four that cannot rush the passer, never have all season, one of the worst in the country at rushing the passer, you got a guy with a banged up knee that when they run that, off, that jet sweep, or all that window dressing motion, that you know probably he's not going to run the ball. If he, do, if he does, he's very tentative. Why don't, bring, why don't you bring pressure? Why don't you aggravate him? Why don't you get into the face of this guy? That's probably the million dollar question because you're not the only person asking this, Corey. I mean, he, he jogs out on the wildcat formation, has to come out of the game because his knee's hurt. Right. I'm going to get to him. Like you said, not hurt him, but get pressure on him, rattle him, and see how he responds that way. You have to. I mean, and you're right. You don't do it to hurt a guy. Nobody's going to take a shot uh, at his knees. And one of the successful deep balls, as you can see by Dylan Thompson. Uh, but the problem is you've got to make him uncomfortable. And I thought... The way we call that defense, or the way Lorenzo Ward called that defense, really played into the strength of what 
Deshaun Watson wanted to do it. They let him hang in the pocket. He threw the football. Uh, you know, then he ran it, of course, in the red zone on short runs when he basically had to. But I was very disappointed on the play calling. And I know Lorenzo Ward, later on, you hear the sound of him talking about the tackling. And, of course, they were in the <laughs> indoors, which to me was uh, a bunch of baloney. But the thing is, this team was not prepared to play offensively, defensively. When you play your in-state rival, the motions have to be there. And I didn't feel like – I don't feel like this team was equipped to go and make it six in a row. They played, I'm telling you, very lackadaisical, very uninspired. To me, like they didn't want, want, want it to be there. They didn't well, want it to be there. A lot of times, you know, the comments, you know, what are you going to do when they punch you in the mouth? Are you going to get it, punch them back? Right. Carolina didn't. Clemson punched them in the mouth. And Carolina did not respond. Yeah, and simple and, and as that. They didn't respond. And Clemson, no doubt, has a good football team. Are they great? No, they're not great. They're good. They average. They got a good defensive line. The linebackers are solid. Secondary is questionable. Offense is just okay. And to me, they were uninspired. They weren't ready to play. And I blame that on the coaches. And I also blame on the coaches the fact that they did not make adjustments on that jet sweep. I mean those. Uh, passes or passing yards that we saw, kind of, you know, not really telling the whole story. They basically are running plays, and I'm going to break those down when we come back after the break. And we're back, Gamecock Chalk Talk. Corey Miller, Pastor Payne, alongside that guy right there, Mike Hole. And of course, now is the time for us to talk about these plays, Mike. The Jets sweep the defense, gave up a ton of yards, 191 yards on the ground rushing. Uh, you know, another freshman, Mr. Scott, I must call him Mr. Scott now. He's a freshman. He had a ton of yards receiving, although some of that is overflated because, uh, because of how they ran these jet sweep things. They're, they're called passes. But you have to defend that almost like you're playing the option. It has to be assignment football because basically it becomes an option. And Absolutely. if you don't play it the right way, Mike, it can be successful. I want to show you a couple of these, and of course, then we'll show you a, a, a nice play by the South Carolina's offense. But this was critical to me in this ball game. To the tape we go. All right, right here. I want to highlight that guy and that guy and that guy. Those are your two deep safeties and your defensive end. Now they're in a slot. They're what we call 11 personnel. You got a tight end in the backfield, one back, and three wide receivers. 11 personnel. This slot guy, the one off the ball, that's Scott. He's going to go in motion. Now, out of that motion, they can give it to him, pitch it to him, I should say. They can, they can pull it, and they can run the option the other way. They got a different a variation of things that they can do. But right here, you got a banged-up quarterback. Let me say it again. A banged-up quarterback with a bad knee. Make him run the football. Run it, Vinny. You're going to see this end right here, out of position. He comes in there, he gets nosy, he's out flanked, bad angles, and off to the race. This is too easy. This is too easy. I want to see it again, and I want him to freeze something so you can really see what we did. Roll it. Now look, freeze, right here, freeze. Now look, everybody, Mike, is out of position. Your end yeah. is beat, right? He's beat. Look at your defensive linemen. They're sealed. Your linebacker, your two inside guys are cut off. The safety's not over the top either. No. And my, only, my other thing is, why don't this top safety up here on the 45-yard line exactly. right, move over with the motion? Yep. When the motion goes, why is this safety staying on the left side? He should at least move to the middle of the field. They, what they call rotate. You know what it looks like to me? They never saw this play before. And that, you know, time. I know that, but what I'm saying is it looks like by the way they played it right here that they've never seen it. Well, obviously they didn't see it enough because they ran it about 18 times. Run it, Benny. Now you can see the safety got a bad angle. He's loafing. Now he's trying to turn on the Jets. He gets outrun, and there's a touchdown. Too easy, and as a coach, you have to make those adjustments. This is something you go you go over and over in the film. That motion goes, the safety rolls, the other safety comes down, the end gets up field. My, my point is Lorenzo Ward should have told 55 or whoever the defensive end was to go hit the quarterback every time because make him uncomfortable. Let's see it again. You would think they would learn from that one play, right? Let's go to the next play. So they don't learn. Here we go again. Same formation. There we go again. Slot. Scott's in the slot. He's going to motion. I would think 
that after that play, you go onto the sidelines and you sit down with your players and you say, hey, the next time they run that, let's adjust. Let's, let's roll the safeties. Now, they got the high safeties. Now, you see him right there. He's high. That safety's going to come down. But watch the end again. Roll it. Here we go. They move. They adjust a little bit. Now, look at it. He gets nosy. There's no way you're going to stop that guy. Now, look at all the wadded up players right there. Bad angles, bad technique, bad football, bad coaching. Well, they're not playing physical either, Corey. I mean, nobody's attacking the guy with the ball. Yeah. They're sitting back and letting the blockers come to them and then creating lanes, and it's just bad football. It's just my, my point is the end, you have to tell him to attack. If, you, if you'll tell him to play force, meaning get up the field, knock out the, the, the sweep guy, the jet sweep guy. If he's running like that, tell the end to get up the field and hit him, make Deshaun Watson keep the football. I mean, there's different ways you can play this. This could be, like I said, playing the option. Assignment football. Bad coaching means that you don't make adjustments. Now, we will give you a good play by the Gamecocks, Mike. And this is an offensive play. I know I got to give you one here. You can see the formation right here. The Gamecocks go what we call the wild Gamecock formation trips out here to the numbers. Pharaoh Cooper's in the lineup. And here we go. Just going to run the trap out of this. Notice we see the lines right there. They pull the guard and the tackle. They seal and kick out. They, he fakes the dive play, and he's off to the race. Now, if you're Clemson, they did a bad job of defending this as well, as well because I think as Vic Beasley up top gets up the field, he opens up a gaping hole for Farrell Cooper. Run it. Here we go. Well, Vic, the dive. Vic, yeah, Vic Beasley runs that uh, pass rush type of uh, uh, rush and does not come down. It creates that lane. Yeah, they get the, the good spill. Ball. Yeah, exactly. He's got to close it. But Carolina gets the kick out, so they do a good job blocking and creates the lane for Well, Carroll. I looked at it. It looked like they brought pressure. That could have been a safety coming off the corner there. But whoever it was has to close down and spill that play, meaning you make that play run to hump. That's what they call close, meaning you close down and make that guard and tackle run a hump. The ball run outside. That gives your linebackers time to scrape and make the play. But, again, Clemson got caught coming off the corner. They get up the field. There's a huge hole, and therefore the Gamecocks get a touchdown. But, again, I'm gonna, I really want to harp on this. Mike, when you're a veteran defensive coordinator, when you're a veteran defensive coordinator, one, you, you go on the sideline. That's why you got somebody up top. You have to make adjustments. There, the reason why those passing numbers of Deshaun Watson are inflated because of a, that jet sweep, and they had success running that play all day long, and the South Carolina Gamecocks still haven't defended it. That's on the coach. Now, I'm going to put that part on the coach. There's one in there where the end got, got hooked and sealed. That's on him. He, he didn't defeat the block. But when you don't make adjustments and roll that safety down and have somebody run that alley and knock that guy out, you're going to get beat on the flanks of your defense. And they did not make adjustments. That's what's disheartening when you watch this tape. When you watch this tape, it's disheartening to see a veteran coordinator or defensive guys not make adjustments. I agree. <laughs> I mean, but, hey, you do it to me once, shame on me. Do it me, shame on you. Right. Do it me twice, three times, right. four times, shame on me. And that's exactly what you're talking about. Uh, make adjustments yeah. on the sidelines. You got coaches in the box. Hey, when the guy goes in motion, here's how we're going to play it from right. now. They did not change the way they attacked that play at all. Yeah, it's just bad football and bad coaching and, and just bad execution at the end of the day. All right, when we come back, we got a guy that knows how to make adjustments and execute. Brian Hand and the Spurs and Feathers will join me. We'll talk about some injuries, maybe some bold possibilities. That's coming up after this timeout. We didn't get a chance to do a lot of talking drills, no excuse. Uh, this week we was inside for the majority of the time, and so when we was in the bubble, we didn't tackle, and, and I, you know, I thought about that all week. And uh, so we tried to they do uh, some tackling when we was in the stadium uh, the two days, but you know, uh, we should have been better uh, at tackling, and, and we'll have to continue to work on it. Did I really just hear that? Welcome back to Gamecock Short Talk. I cannot believe I just heard that sound bite, but that's what Lorenzo Ward said. I mean, they had to practice indoors, therefore the tackling was bad. Let me see. I played in Minnesota in a dome. I played in Houston in a dome. Atlanta had a dome. I mean, that's New Orleans has a dome. I played there. And if my memory serves me correctly, 
I tackle folks in that carpet. Just just saying. I don't know what that had to do with anything. All right, let's move on. Brian Hamm, my man, and 50 grand of Spurs and Feathers <laughs> joining me right now. Of course, you were at the game at the press mm -hmm. conference. I think you would like sit next to Webby, weren't you? Yeah, right there beside him when he said that. It was a little surprising. How would you look at it? <laughs> I, like, I, I was kind of shocked just because I don't, I mean, particularly because he said no excuse and then he went into the excuse. And I, mm -hmm. and I don't really think he know, he really was thinking about what he was saying, to right. be honest with you. Because, I mean, obviously they tackled when they were getting ready for the game. Or you would hope so. But you got to remember, that's not something that South Carolina does that much at practice anyway. Right. That's just not something that Spurrier believes in. Well, you remember Ellis Johnson mm -hmm. when he was here. He always yeah. complained that they felt like they needed to have more physical mm -hmm. practices and well, uh, listen, if you're in the 13th week of yeah. the season or whatever, how many weeks, if you don't know how to tackle by yeah. now, you got some issues. Yeah. And you really do. And they had some issues tackling. I just showed you they had angle problems. They had assignment problems. They had problems. We saw this old defense, Brian, show up again. I went on the record and said, gave him credit for South Alabama and Florida. What happened? I don't know. That's the simple way. When Scott Moore was even asked that after the game, and they said, you know, I don't know. We're just going to have to get to fu back to fundamentals during bowl practice and then the offseason. That's not what you want to hear in week 13, as you're saying, particularly after you just lost to the, your rival for the first time in six outings. So. No fan wants to hear that. No. I mean, you know, we were indoors. We didn't, no, no, if you watch this tape, you can see right here once mm -hmm. again, Scott had a month. These are yeah. freshmen. Yeah. These are guys that don't have it all together yet, and they're running by you like – you're in grade school to me, Brian. And today, Steve Spurrier said, hey, he's going to come back and coach. Mm -hmm. The staff is going to be back. I don't see how in the world that you can retain guys. And I don't want to see guys lose their jobs. Nobody yeah. does. But they get a lot of money to, to, to lose their jobs. So I'm not feeling as bad. If, if Wemmy gets, uh, you know, has to go or demote, he makes $1.5 million. I can't feel bad about that. Mm -hmm. But you got to have performance with that kind of salary. Yeah, and I think that's the, the issue. I think all these coaches asked that in our off-the-field segment with Coach Sperry a couple weeks ago. Did he know what he was getting into? Right. Did these guys know what they're getting into when they become coaches? I think you have to. That's the trade-off. You get paid a lot of money, but you also know there's going to be a lot of scrutiny. Right. I and, mean, it's like Will Muschamp and Bo Pelini and these guys, yeah. Ellis Johnson. Guess what? They lose their jobs. Yeah. They got fat. They can go live the rest of their lives on the beach. Yeah. Now they're not crying the river. I mean, so yeah. I'm not going to cry the river. But at the end of the day, what are you hearing from the fan base? I mean, you know, I I, I got. I'm think I'm going to show some of these later on and read them at least yeah. in the next segment of folks. I asked you, Lorenzo Ward, or the defensive staff be back. Yeah. What are you hearing from the folks on your side? <laughs> yeah, they, they don't want him back. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, it, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I like Whammy a lot. Right. I, think he, I think he's a good coach. I mean, he is a coach that's good been recruiter. around. Good, great recruiter. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the main thing you're losing is, if anything, if, if Whammy goes. But, you know, most people, I think, are really sticking everything from this season on the defense. And the head of the defense is Lorenzo Ward. So I think that that's where they feel the buck's got to stop. Nobody wants Spurrier to leave. I, I have seen a few wayward fans say that they think. Really? That, yeah, that Spurrier needs to go, that he's getting a little old, that the time's gone. But that's not the majority. The only thing I would say to that is the fact that a coach of his status, yeah. a legendary coach, a Hall of Fame coach, they don't want to go out on the, on the no. bad end. No, I agree. And when you look at this team next year, next year, excuse me, Dylan Thompson's gone. You don't have a quarterback with zero reps. Yeah. Uh, you might lose Mike Davis. You, you, he says he got help on the way, Brian, but he's a, he's a freshman that you're going to depend on? Yeah, you got Brandon Wiles coming back. You got Farrow Cooper coming mm. back. I, I mean, you do have that option you with got Farrow some Cooper if you have to go that way. But Connor Mitch has done better in price than I think people want to mm. believe. And they. He just wasn't Dylan Thompson, mm -hmm. but he's still there. You got Spurrier's really high on Skarnecchia. Yeah. You know, you got some pieces. Oh, play. There's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of yep. people. Lorenzo Nunez is coming in. There's a lot of piece, pieces still there. They haven't played. Right. But, but the, all, like I said, like you just <laughs> said a minute ago, and like I said earlier today on radio, either had Artavia Scott or uh, Deshaun Watson last year. I mean, yes, it's harder on defense and it's right. a different thing. But you never know year to year, every year is different. And, and like you said, I don't think Spurrier wants to go out this way. But he also knows that he has one of the top ten recruiting classes coming in in the nation. And maybe that will save him also. Mm -hmm. He has Steve Spurrier Jr. on the staff mm -hmm. and Scotty Jr. on the staff that they're getting paid too. So when you're fathered, you might probably try to look out for your kids a little bit longer. I'm, I mean, I'm just throwing that out there. I'm not saying that to be fact. Yeah. But I can see how he would say, maybe I'll stay back. Well, and I think you can look at it even like this. I don't think that's A number one on his priority mm -hmm. list. But he's a really family guy. He treats his program mm -hmm. like a family. Everybody, you know, in the, in the program on the coaching staff, he wants to be part of the family. So he doesn't want really mm -hmm. any of these guys. So I think he's really evaluating what's the best thing for him, for his coaching staff, mm -hmm. and South Carolina. All right, we got 20 seconds. Belt Bowl, 
Independence. It sounds like Belk Bowl and could be Shreveport. It's really looking like Birmingham right now. Uh, uh -oh. I would say that Jacksonville's not out of the realm of play. They sat behind us at the Clemson game, and, you know, they said anything could happen, so they could end up in Jacksonville. All right. Well, he's Brian Hans, Spurs and Feathers. Uh, Birmingham, that Papa John's Bowl, they ran out of pizza, and they lost to Connecticut. That's just saying. We'll be back just a moment. All right, welcome back. I have a couple of minutes left. And I tweeted earlier since the ball coach said he wasn't going to dismiss Lorenzo Ward. So I asked folks, should Lorenzo Ward and the defensive staff stay or go? Here's some tweets. Uh, Taylor says, heck no. Ward, Adams, and Bakken should be shown the door. Barry says, uh, no, everybody should go except Grady. Sean Smith, a former Gamecock player, NFL guy, says, no, they need to fire Ward and the defensive line coach. Them boys are overweight and out of shape. They don't even use their hands. One more, uh, let's see here. It says, uh, demote Ward for recruiting sake and bring in Muschamp. If you want to send some uh, responses at Pastor Payne and, or at Watch Fox, we can read those uh, on our internet website. All right, Mike, your last show, final thoughts. You've got 15 seconds. Well, it wasn't the season we thought it would be, or at least I thought it would be, mm -hmm. Corey. Um, I expected a lot more from this team. Unfortunately, I think there was a lot of growing pains. You lost a lot of key players from last year's team, and then we saw the effects of that this year. No doubt about it. Appreciate you, man. Thank you. All right, that's going to do it for us. Chalk Talk will return with some basketball next week.